here at the first debate in this mayoral by-election. My name is Neil Hetherington, and I have the awesome privilege of being the CEO of the Daily Bread Food Bank. Before the pandemic, the city was in a crisis. We were seeing some 60,000 client visits every single month, and then the pandemic hit. We started to see 120,000 client visits every single month. And now, this past March, you were all horrified when there were 270,000 client visits in the city of Toronto. We can do better. The Daily Bread Food Bank has risen to the occasion, and nothing makes me prouder. But to what end? And that is the question tonight for each of the candidates that you're going to hear from. How can we decrease the lineups outside of food banks all across the city? We know that answer involves bringing people together. We know that a coalition will drive good policies to reduce the number of people who are relying on food banks. And so it's no surprise that we have a coalition of great partners tonight. And I am grateful for the partnership with all of the community partners, in particular, AXA, Feed Scarborough, Lamp, Women's Habitat, and Second Harvest. Together with tens of thousands of volunteers, clients, donors, daily bread agencies across the city, we are a coalition that is discontent with the status quo and ever hopeful for our city. Every day, I see a parent who needs affordable housing and can't get it and has to turn to the daily bread food bank. Every single day, I see an individual who was promised that if they, they got an education and they, they went on to work, that they would be able to thrive in our community. That's been a broken promise for too many. Every day I see everyday Torontonians having to rely on food charity who we can't do better. And that's where each of these candidates comes in and the 96 additional candidates who have put their name forward. They are telling the city they want to make things better and that they're willing to put their name on the line. They are willing to be that person to bring hope to a family who's making that impossible choice between rent or food. They are willing to be that person who's, who's optimistic about the future and making uh, it hopeful and possible for individuals not to have to make decisions between paying a federal bill or paying for medications. These are individuals who want to be the person to bring positivity to Toronto, every Torontonian who's questioning whether or not they'll ever get by in this city. And we are so grateful to each of them who have raised their hand to public service. So let's get this thing started. Uh, our moderator tonight is a national producer, field reporter, radio and television host. She has reported on some of the biggest events of our day. She covers a vast array of local, national and international news. Your moderator tonight is Maggie John. And I'll tell you two things about Maggie, and only one of the two is true. She is married to Elton John, and she knows the date that the Edmonton Crosstown will be finished. <laughs> only one of those two things is true. I'll let you figure out which one it is, and for now, I'd ask you to put your hands together for our moderator, Maggie John. Nonetheless, 
We recognize the limitation of polling and name recognition uh, in politics, so all registered candidates were invited to submit a written statement about themselves and their priorities. You can view those statements on Daily Bread's blog at dailybread.ca. We are pleased to have five candidates here tonight. The sixth candidate, in fact, Martin Saunders, declines the invitation. All right, welcome to the stage. And, and, it, and we pulled uh, the names out of a hat, so uh, they are based on the order that we pulled. Please, again, hold your applause until all the candidates are off the stage. First, Anna Bylaw. Brad Bradford. Josh Matlow. Hold your applause, please. Mitzi Hunter.
which is about people not having the income because it's going towards rent and keeping a roof over their head. And housing affordability is central to our city and to the livability and the affordability of our city. And we have to solve this. And so we need new solutions, we need fresh eyes. And that's why I'm in this race to be the mayor of Toronto, is to make sure that we have a city that, you know, it is at a turning point. We don't want our city to come at a breaking point. We need a city that works for everyone, everywhere. And that's why I'm ready to be the mayor of Toronto, putting forward the most detailed and comprehensive plan than any other mayor to candidate for affordable housing for both renters as well as those who want to own. Making sure that we fix things like transit and all of those things that are critical to the livability of our city. So let's work together to fix the six. I ask you for your support. Join me. My friend Ying, volunteer at the Fort York Food Bank on College Street. And I walk by College Street because I am, I live very close to it. And I watch the line rolls, weekly, monthly. And then I thought of my mother, it could be my mom, it could be my dad lining up there. Why? My mom and dad and I immigrated to Canada when I was 13. Like a lot of you, life was tough when you first immigrated to Canada. My dad wasn't able to find a job, even though he spoke fluent English and taught in Hong Kong. Couldn't find a job teaching in Canada in the 70s. He had a nervous breakdown. He couldn't get a job could hold down a job. My mom, with one income as a maid in a hotel, was able to get the food to feed the family and still pay the rent in St. Jamestown. We were able to survive. We didn't have food bags back then. But life is so different now. Life is so unaffordable. Why? Because we have a decade of people not building housing. And that is unacceptable. And that is the whole cause of the problem. So we have a choice to make today. We have to choose to come together and say that we need to build housing. We need together build a city that is more affordable more caring, safer, where everyone belongs, where no one has to go to food bank in order to feed their kids and pay their rent. Said, 
one in five people that use the food banks use 100% of their income to pay rent. As mayor, I will urgently build housing. I will fix services like the GTC. We are facing significant challenges. We need a mayor that is going to hit the ground running on day one, that is going to work with the council to make sure that we fix the services and that doesn't need to be learning on the job. I have the track record to build a house. I have the track record to work with other governments to deliver for the city. Pulled out of our hat. 
So uh, this question we will first have a response from Olivia Chow, and then we will move to Andrew Hillel and so forth. And just a reminder that uh, once we've all, okay, I'm just going to read the, the rules so that we're all on the same page. So there will be three questions. Candidates, you have 90 seconds to respond. Once we've heard from all the candidates, we will then come back to you in the same order for an additional 60 seconds each for rebuttals. And we'll look for our timekeeper to keep us on track. Okay, first response goes to Olivia Chow. Daily Bread Food Bank just shattered a new record with close to 270,000 visits to food banks in March. Four times the average number of visits before the pandemic. Food insecurity is a symptom of poverty, yet Toronto's poverty reduction strategy has been chronically underfunded for years. With record inflation rates, we are only seeing both poverty and food insecurity rise in our city. How will you address growing food insecurity in Toronto, and how will you fund these initiatives? Ms. Chowdhury, please start. My grandkids tells me that when you're hungry, you can't learn. Indeed, no child can learn when they're hungry. It is a desperate situation because there are, in fact, kids going to their hungry. When I was a counselor a while ago, I was also a City of Toronto child advocate. At that time, I massively expanded the student nutrition program so that those kids in schools that need a meal would in fact have food. It now deliver good, decent food to 200,000 children. And we need to do a lot more. Yeah, 200,000 children. And there are a lot more, of course, the, but the root of the problem is housing. You heard all of us say the same thing. So firstly, we have to build affordable housing, but there's so much more we can do. Community garden, community kitchen, boat purchasing, nutrition program. And I will tell you a lot more when I get the second round, because there's so much more that we can do together. It's not the government that's going to do ODSB. 
but we need to be strong advocates because what we're dealing with right now is legislated poverty. If you are unable to work and you are only taking home $1,200 a month, you are below the poverty line, which is $2,100 a month. We need a strong champion, and as your mayor, I will be that strong champion to push the provincial government to close the poverty gap. And we need to work with our food banks, but Neil will tell you that victory is when there is no longer a need for a food bank. So how do we improve affordability for Torontonians across the city so that they are not relying on fantastic organizations like this one and others to put food on the table? We have to work together to make life more affordable for Torontonians. I really believe that every Torontonian has a right to culturally appropriate, sustainably, sustainably produced, and food that they can purchase and afford. Every single Torontonian should have access to food security. But it's not any one government that is responsible. I disagree that it's not the municipality. I believe it's all of us, every one of us. It's the city, it's the federal government, it's the province, they should be upping social assistance in an emergency mode right now, especially as inflation is hitting so many people. We should be working together to move forward with the plan that I put forward, Public Bill Toronto. There is no reason why private developers should be pocketing the profits. We should be putting money toward building affordable housing, RGI, and other levels on city properties now. to rooftop gardens, to people like Abby Huggin, who actually goes, we have individuals in the city that actually go and pick fruit from wealthy people's properties and distribute it to others. Woo! Together we can address this, but let's not do this, let's actually put together a plan and move forward together. Thank you. Woo! So when I put forward my plan to run for mayor, I started with homelessness. And I was at the Boys and Girls Club talking to some young people because 10% of people living rough on our streets are, are youth. And one young woman said to me, Mitzi, just look behind the buildings, beside the dumpster, because that's where people are living in our city. In a city as wealthy as Toronto, a country as wealthy as we are, people should not be struggling with food. The Daily Bread Food Bank, when it was created, you were supposed to be out of business by now. And that's not the case. And in fact, when you go to the grocery stores, and we see these yellow boxes, they're not as full as they once were. Because there's rising cost of food, rising cost of food. And people are not even able to donate as much as they would have before. And so, you know, the Daily Bread Food Bank is at a crisis point, not only should it not be in business, it's actually running out of enough food to feed the numbers of people who are hungry. If you look at the lineups, it's people with jobs that are wrapped around the buildings at food banks like the Oasis that I visited this past weekend. And so we've got to get to the root cause. I've put forward a housing affordability plan that will build more affordable housing, that will double the school nutrition program and provide more access for people who need that help and support in our city right now. Before we hear the rebuttals, I, I do want to reiterate the question because I think we need to hear some concrete examples of what this looks like for me. strategy uh, the city has been working on has a vision statement. I'm going to read that to you. And it states, by 2035, Toronto is a city that, with opportunities for all, a leader in collective pursuit of justice, fairness, and equity. We want to be renowned as a city where everyone has access to good jobs, adequate income, stable housing, affordable transportation, nutritious food, and supportive services. So I think, as Torontonians, they need to hear how many plans are to get us there. By 2035, that's only 12 years away. Ms. Chow. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. 
still have a question. Um, you're absolutely right. We do have a responsibility. So I mentioned very concrete things like community gardens, growing food together, community kitchen. But at the heart of it is building housing. The city of Toronto getting back in housing business. Because we have been absent for far too long. We have not built any housing whatsoever. And it's time that we start. As mayor, I will build 25,000 units of housing, which means that less people will have to pay high rent because they are affordable. I will really begin with that. Also, I would have partnership with African Food Basket because right now we have a food, a Black Food Toronto uh, program, and they need a lot more support because Black Torontonians are nine percent of the population, but three times more likely to be food insecure. Thank you, Ms. Wiza. Uh, I mentioned very concrete steps uh, with money and actions that I would take, but I, I want to talk about something that is called Community Benefits Agreement. You know when the city actually builds something, has a big project or approves a development, we have the power to actually get agreements to make sure that the local community has apprenticeships that the local community has jobs, that the local community benefits from that opportunity as well. That is something that needs to happen with every project that we do in the City of Toronto and major development that it happens in the City of Toronto. Looking forward to talking more about housing in the next question. You know, in the summer of 2021, I organized a food drive with Olympian Penny Alexiak, and we were able to collect 1,200 pounds of food from the community in a single day. Those types of actions take place across the city day after day, week after week, and, and so many of those, those food resources end up here at Daily Bread. What hasn't been discussed is that Daily Bread has been working seven days a week, 365, for decades. And as we have come through one crisis through the pandemic, these frontline workers were showing up every single day. What local government can do, and what I will do as mayor, is work with our food banks, work with Daily Bread, to ensure that they are in a position to deliver those mission-critical services during times of crisis. When generators need to be running to keep the fridges going, to preserve the food, they need our support. And Daily Bread and other organizations are doing this city a service. As your mayor, I will be here to support the good work of these organizations and continue to provide people with food when they need it during crisis. Well, I certainly uh, would like to agree with some of my colleagues. Of course, we should be supporting community benefits and ensuring that residents, including our youth at risk, have opportunities to get into the trades and succeed. Absolutely, we need to promote community gardens, allotment gardens, community gardens to make sure that people have local access to, 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 to local uh, produced food. We also need to, and we can't forget this, the Green Belt is not just outside of our city, it comes through our city. And, you know, if Doug Ford is going to be giving away uh, the Green Belt to his donors, my job is going to be to fight to make sure that we give it to our kids. Roberts had this amazing ability to connect food to everything that he used to write about because it connects to everything we do, whether it be housing, the affordability of transit, everything we do, if people have more money in their pocket after they pay the rent, they can live a good life, a good quality life, and a healthy life. My plan is to increase food security by doubling the community services program. So programs like the school nutrition program, young kids can have healthy food, healthy snacks. Making sure we have community gardens so people have fresh food, the access to fresh foods, doubling that. And of course, updating the Toronto Charter. But the key is affordable housing. I have a concrete, comprehensive plan to build more affordable housing by unlocking 
the city-owned lands to build affordable housing, making sure that we have more access for those who are renting or even affordable home ownership. And it is the most comprehensive plan of any other Marathon candidate, and it really gets to that source. I was very proud to be at the cabinet table when we introduced community benefits. Absolutely, if we're spending government money on these types of building projects, we need to make sure people get access to jobs and employment as well. Thank you. Speaking of affordable housing, we're going to move on to affordable housing. Our first question, and uh, sorry, our next question, the first response will go to Anna Milo. The, the average rent of a listed one bedroom is now $2,500 a month far out of reach for many people in the city. Almost 90% of purpose-built rentals in Ontario were built over 40 years ago. The subsidized housing wait list has over 84,000 people on it in Toronto. Building more rental housing requires both money and time. But in the meantime, renters are struggling. The federal and provincial governments in the past 10 years have shown that they cannot be relied upon to solve this issue for the city of Toronto. My question, what approaches will you take using municipal finances and tools specifically to address the lack of affordable rental options in the city and protect low renters? And Bella. Thank you. Well, I want to make sure that we have a city youth can remain here, where workers who live here, where seniors age where they spend all their life. And that's why I have a plan that will put people first, will build homes, and uh, it will get the city moving. By protecting renters, I will triple rent bank. I will in, start uh, eviction prevention with the municipal license and, com and uh, 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 department that prevents rent evictions. A lot of people are facing rent evictions right now, and the city needs to take a role in preventing and assisting tenants to fight that. We need to make sure, we need to make sure that we have a temporary freeze right now on rental demolition, and do a comprehensive city-wide review, because we don't know if we're gonna have the power or now or not to have rental replacement. I will work with nonprofit organizations to ensure that we have the land and the pre-construction funds so they can build more. I uh, will champion the missing middle after all the groundwork that we've done to make sure that it's built. And I will make sure that 57,000 units, at least 20% of the 285,000 units that we will build in Toronto are purpose-built rental. Some of my colleagues 
along with our predecessor, has supported a project called Housing Now that still, six years later, doesn't have a single shovel to the ground and no affordable units built. That's why I've been pushing a council and I'm determined to get done as mayor, public build Toronto, so that the developer's profits become the money that we actually invest into building more housing. RGI, 80% in the market. Even though, my, even though my colleagues voted against this when I moved to Florida Council, we need rent control on all new units that are being built on our properties. Now, we, also, we also need to go after fraudulent landlords, whether it be fake landlord use evictions, whether it be dev evictions, we need to go after them. I initiated Rent Safe to also go after them when it comes to ignoring work orders, making sure that people's homes Homes are safe and healthy. There is so much we need to do. We need to cap the the uh, we need to cap the temperature during the shoulder seasons. People boil and half during half the year. We need to increase the fines on landlords for property standards violations. Ultimately, ultimately, you will see that my plan is the only plan that is actually fully costed and genuinely delivered. Thank you. You know, as the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood, one of the number one issues that came into our office was on renters and how people needed to stay housed. They were struggling with this very much. And that's why this is the centerpiece of my platform, Running for Mayor of Toronto. Because we need to make sure that everyone has a place to live. Housing is a human right. And a big part of affordability in this city is the 50% of people who rent. And so my plan, which is comprehensive, it's, it's there that anyone can take a look at it. It provides more publicly available affordable housing than anyone else on the mayoralty ballot. Because this is the key that we have to unlock, which is how people can have access to affordable and deeply affordable, not just average, average market rents, and housing for families, two and three bedrooms, so that we can have homes that people can actually live in, not just tiny slices of condos in the sky. So this is about making sure that 77% of the Toronto Affordable Housing Corporation that I will establish is actually affordable housing and deeply affordable housing. We cannot solve this problem with the same faces from the same places with the same ideas that are not working. We have to change that in this city because the people of this city deserve someone who has fresh eyes and new solutions to tackle the challenges that we face. And I want to fix the six, and that's why I'm running to be the mayor of this city. It's so destroying when you get evicted. I've spoken to people that get into a mental health crisis. And I often thought, because my dad had mental health issues, had I not intervened, he could have been out in the street. So first thing, because 50% of Torontonians are in fact renters. We need to stop the eviction now, which is why, yeah, financially and socially, they need the support. Double the rent bank, triple the eviction prevention in community program, which provide social support. And get those landlords that are doing things illegally. Provide the organizing tool for the tenants so they can get together and protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And if they want to own their units so they would never be evicted again, the city buy some of those buildings, fix it, turn it into a Me as your mayor, you know your voice will be heard. I 
will give you an opportunity for a rebuttal. I, I do want to bring back some of the points in the first question. Uh, what I underline that one bedroom right now in the city is uh, $2,500 a month. I do remember interviewing a woman who said that she was contemplating breaking the law because she couldn't afford rent so that she could ha actually have a house over her head, meaning go to prison. I mean, that's how bad it is in, in the city. So I'm going to read some more stats. The maximum OBSB rate for a single individual is tw a little over $1,200 a month and $733 for an OW, well below Toronto's official poverty line of $2,060 per month. What would your plans mean for the day-to-day out-of-pocket expense for those living in subsidized rental units? What would the average market rent be and how much would that leave people to spend on other essentials that they need to be able to get by? And well. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to address something is that, you know, magical math and more bureaucracy is not going to bring you affordable housing. What is going to bring you affordable housing is the concrete plans and people with a track record. I can tell you that I have delivered housing in the city. We can actually compare the numbers. We have Councillor Josh Matlin with a lot more development in his area. And since 2017, he's been able to secure 190 units of affordable housing. In Davenport, since 2017, with a lot less development, I've secured over 600 units of affordable housing. incorrect math and this is the worst type of politics when you get into a campaign and you start preaching about the math you're not actually going to deliver anything you're not being honest Josh Matlow's plan is off by a factor of 10 he says he'll deliver 15,000 units the math works out to a measly 1500 this guy has made a career of opposing housing in Midtown he takes an affordable housing site on Burton in a 30-story neighborhood on a $1 billion transit line and he knocks it down to 15 stories. I have to go to council to pile on the density so that we have more affordable housing options for more people. Don't trust him, he's like Josh Mallow. He's never been there on housing, he's got a failed track record. We don't need more of that. We need people who will take real action to live for real supply to make life in this city more affordable.
And so, you know, we've got to get to the root issue and we got to stop the bickering and get on with building because people in this city are at a crisis point and they cannot afford the rents. My plan does cap rents on city-owned housing units. It does provide units that are supported as well. So let's get on with making sure people have a place to live in this city. $90,000 a household. That's close to almost 200,000 people are stuck on a waiting list for affordable housing. City homes, social housing. None of these so-called affordable housing being built or, or being talked about works for them. You know why? Because not rent geared to income. It's more than a third of their income. They can't afford it. Affordable homes is really a third of your income. Rent geared to your income. So immediately, what I would do is to have a thousand units of rent supplement so that those people that are on the waiting list or in the shelters that are using your food bank right now will have a home and a wraparound service so they stay housed. And that is immediate. We can do this. We need to come together and say yes, that we can do this. And don't buy the, uh, the line that affordable housing is really that affordable. Uh, question, the first response will go to Brad Radford. There are hundreds of thousands of people in Toronto who rely on public transit to access work, school, and community, and social services. It's no secret that the TTC has been suffering. From service cuts to higher fares, Torontonians are paying more for less. Well, Metrolink plays a role in transit in the city as well, we would like to focus here on the TTC specifically. How are you going to make TTC affordable, reliable, and safe for riders, and how will you finance these just using municipal revenue tools? Brad Brad. Thanks very much. Um, we have funding challenges at the TTC, and that's because ridership is down. Now, I've been out every day talking to thousands of Torontonians. I ride transit all the time. And if you talk to people why, about why they're not taking transit, it's because they don't feel safe. I was on the subway on my way down to town today, and you see it on the platform. People's backs are jammed against the wall because they're afraid that they might actually end up on the tracks. Uh, I've talked to so many parents whose kids used to take TTC to get to school, and now they're not. And if they are, they're sending a text message when they get on transit, and they're sending a text message when they get to school. So we have a huge challenge from a revenue perspective because ridership is down. But we need to be honest and address the number one concern, which is safety. So I came out with my TTC plan that will address this head on. Number one, we will finally install platform edge doors. Now we're not gonna do all 70 stations all at once. We're gonna start with the busiest interchange stations. The City Hall has been talking about this for over a decade. We can stand that up. Number two, we will increase the security presence in stations. People are uncomfortable. There is a role for special constables to be there in our stations. But we also need to make sure that people have supports, mental health, substance use, folks experiencing homelessness. And we need to have one coordinated agency so that people can get the help when and where they need it on transit. And lastly, cell service. It doesn't matter who your carrier is, everybody needs access to cellular. It's about safety, it's basic table stakes. Well, so first of all, I am a constant fan of fun to ensure that we can move forward with reversing the TTC cuts that have been done over the last two years. Can you imagine, can you imagine a restaurant coming out of the pandemic and uh, you know they decide to give you like really crappy service and hike the, the menu prices, you wouldn't go back there. And that's what uh, my predecessor, if I'm elected, and some of his allies supported. That was wrong. It was a bad business model, it was also unfair to riders. And that's why the City Works Fund is gonna be helping ded be dedicated toward in the first year, start improving those services, make them reliable. 
it's not safe, it's also, it's not safe enough when you're, when you're facing more delays throughout the city, when you're waiting dark on the platform uh, for the bus, waiting longer in the dark for your bus or your subway. That doesn't contribute to reliability, safety, or affordability. Woo. I'm also going to be expanding transit in Scarborough, but I'm going to try a new approach. I'm going to be using evidence. We're going to be using evidence. We're going to be making sure that we expand the, the Shepherd Line out to Nielsen. We're going to be moving forward with the Eglinton East LRT. We're going to be building the busway along the old RT route, so Scarborough residents are left on the bus in the middle of traffic. And we're going to be building a network of trails so that Scarborough residents can walk, bike, and take transit, have a lot of options, whether it be transit on wheels or rails or active transportation. Woo! Woo! Train. So being from Scarborough, I know what it's like to not have reliable transit service. And, you know, I've listened to you for years say that Scarborough doesn't deserve transit investment in terms of the Scarborough subway extension. So it's great to see that that tune is changing. We need to make sure that we have transit services right now. The TTC, I have a five point plan for safety on the TTC, making sure that it is safe and reliable for people to take. That includes pairing social workers with the transit officers. It includes making sure that, you know, around transit stations, we have ambassadors to keep that station as clean and as well lit and as, as active as possible. We also need to make sure that we build out our transit system. So think of it for the future. And uh, the Eglinton East LRT needs to be built in Scarborough. I've, I've announced uh, having deep design plans for the North York and the Scarborough subway extension so that we can close that loop and make a link in our city. So get people back on our transit system and let's get them on right now, making it free for seniors. So that will also help with a little more money back for everyone. As well as for real trans users, transit has to be at the heart of our city, making sure people can get around our city and they can do that safely and that they are they feel safe and they are safe as well. Okay, how many of you have been stuck in buses, stuck in subways, yeah, stuck waiting like in, in sardines, and just being really stuck and waiting for a bus that takes forever to come? I see you nodding. I get it. Absolutely. It takes forever. And it's now after the budget cuts that some of them inflicted. You now have to wait longer and you pay more, which is totally unfair. You know what the first thing we're gonna do? Reverse the cuts. That's so obvious. Reversing the cuts and investing in TDC means more people will ride it. Meaning that there will be more money coming into TDC. So we don't go down the downward spiral. And this, that was how it started when we had the pandemic. Coming out, we need to invest more, not less. Okay? And, of course, we need to build that Scarborough busway on the RT line, saving people in Scarborough 20 minutes a day. That's two hours a week that you can spend with your family rather than stuck in buses. About time, right? Eh? Yeah. And there are so much more we can do. We can get a fair deal for our transit because, oh, I'll come back to the fair deal for transit in a minute. to be on our stations to make sure we have eyes and ears on the stations. 
to make sure that we reverse the cuts, that we add cameras, not only in the subways, but across the systems, the system in our streetcars and in our buses. And yes, that we have Wi-Fi, like I've been talking since I first announced that I was thinking of running for the election. I will also say that uh, until the separated BRT uh, is done in Scarborough, we will have, I will make sure to have two dollars a fare for the SRT users in Scarborough because there have been so inconvenienced. I think it's the least we can do. What I won't do, what I won't do is walk away from the negotiating table to make sure that the province is actually paying for those costs. That I won't do like other candidates that are here. Um, I did ask about making the DTC affordable and reliable. We heard a lot about safety, which I appreciate, but want to understand the financial changes and revenue tools specifically. You know, I look at some cities who have offset their costs for transit by instituting taxes, in, uh, taxes, uh, tolls as well, to lessen the dependency of transit on fares and for operation. These are just examples. We would love to hear more about the concrete money. That's what I think that's what our Toronto means. That, that's what the people here want to hear when it comes down to cost. Okay, uh, Brad, Brad, go ahead. I'm glad you asked about cost. I'm glad you asked about cost because everything I'm hearing right now from candidates on the stage is going to be very expensive. And they're not being honest with you about how they're going to pay for it. A fun fact about the TTC is two thirds of the operating dollars come from the fare box. That's not a fair deal for Torontonians. If you look at jurisdictions across North America, you always see state, provincial, federal dollars coming in to support operating costs. We do not get a nickel from the province or the federal government when it comes to operating. I will be a strong advocate to make sure that those other levels of government pay their share for transit. But safety is a key piece too because ridership is down. And when we think about the fare box being two thirds of the revenue, supplemented by over a billion dollars of taxpayer money, but two thirds of that is revenue from the fare box, and ridership is at historic lows, which is still at 60%. People are not riding transit because they don't feel safe on transit. Nobody here is talking about safety, but that is how we get people back so that the TTC is a safe and reliable option. Thank you. So it's not going to be just about expressing uh, anger, and it's not going to be uh, Doug Ford uploading the gardener. It's going to be us actually getting our, ho our own house in order. Absolutely, we need a new deal for Toronto. It is absurd that 70% of the revenue for the TTC operating costs are, are put through the fare box. That's not sustainable, it's unique in the world. That said though, I just want to get on with it. Uh, the reality is we've got to be honest about and be upfront about the need, that, the need for revenue to be able to address these concerns. So not only am I going to be putting the money saved from the garter towards our, our priorities, but I'm also going to be implementing a commercial parking lot levy. And the commercial parking lot levy is part of our plan to address the climate crisis. One of the best ways to address the climate crisis is to incent people to use public transit and I'm going to be investing toward not only improving services, but making sure that it's reliable, affordable, and safe. I don't have enough time to go through the whole plan, but it's actual money that we can actually spend on that priority rather than, you know, just talking about it. Woo, woo, woo. Thank you. So it goes without saying that, and you've heard this from all the candidates, that we need a transit system and we need one that works. And we need to get Toronto moving again. And that's why I have a concrete plan from which to do so. First, we need to end the death spiral on the DTC by lowering service and raising fares. And I will reverse that. Second, we need fair, fair fares. We need to eliminate the dual fares paid by transit users when they switch between TTC and GO. And that's something that will lower the fares for people each day. Third, we need to boost the ridership. And that means, you know, making sure that people can access the system. I will be making that free for seniors and wheel trans users. And fourth, we need to continue building out our transit system, especially in priority areas like in the east, the east, the, the east 
Leg of the East Scott LRT and the North York Scarborough Subway Extension as well as the Waterfront LRT. And we also need to make sure that the TTC is safe, it feels safe, and that it actually is safe. And that's how we'll get Toronto moving again on the TTC. For many Torontonians, TTC is the only way for them to move. And it needs to be the better way again. And yes, I will invest in public transit. And how? Well, right now, these transit enforcers comes in and asks us to pay $235 each time. Like, the, the problem with that is half the time, I mean, I've experienced it. The pesto card sometimes doesn't work, so I'll be standing there tapping, and they will come and say, please pay uh, TDC fair invest in invasion uh, plan because it's just unfair. $235 is too much. A fair deal also means that the province have to come back to the table. They used to pay 70% of the operating cost, 30% is from the city. Now they walked away. If you every time I look at Go Transit, I see Go Train being paid by the Ontario government and nothing for TTC, and that is just not fair. Let's get our deal from the province of Ontario. So when we're fixing the TTC, we're actually helping fixing our budget. The province has been coming with a check at the end of the year to help the city. We need a sustainable solution, predictable funding. That's why they need to take back the responsibility of the environment and the DVP. It is highways that have been downloaded. 50% of the people riding on those highways do not live in Toronto. We are the only municipality in this region that is actually paying for those highways. We need to use that money to actually invest in services. It's actually a smart and pragmatic solution. Other candidates are saying it's not because they can't do it, because they can't work with other orders of government, because they can't deliver for the city of Toronto and make sure that we get a fair deal for Candidates will have an opportunity to ask another candidate a question of their choosing. We will continue in the same rotation, so the first candidate to ask a question will be Josh Matlow. You'll have 45 seconds to ask your question. The respondents will then have 90 seconds for their response. The person who asked the question will then have an additional 45 seconds to follow up, and the respondent will then have 60 seconds for final remarks. And again, we're going to keep this simple. Correct? All right. Mr. Mallow, go ahead. Uh, so I, I have a question for uh, you and Lydia. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and truly, this is a question that, I, that I, I really don't understand the answer to, so I, I ask it to you in good faith. Um, so I really appreciate your, your tenant protection uh, policy proposal, and I mean, it's very similar to mine, and we, I think we share a lot of values on that. But while mine is costed, Yours is based on, um, on the vacant home tax. And what I don't understand about basing it on that tax itself is A, uh, the Toronto Star reported that there are only 2,100 vacant homes in the city. So in other words, of the uh, $112 million that you are gonna rely on, it only brings in about $6 million. And the other point of the tax, if you understand it well, is that it's meant to be made redundant, right? So the whole point isn't to bring in revenue, it's about to have fewer vacant homes. So how do you how do you justify that in Hennig Square? The answer is for how long? Uh, you have uh, 90 seconds. 90 seconds, okay. Uh, yes, I've done some math. Used to be on the budget committee for 10 years, always had a balanced budget. Uh, I get it. The vacancy tax, I'm going to raise it from 1 to 3%. You'll get some of the money, not all. I'm ready to tax. It's, I, if, we, if you look at my affordable housing plan, I was, I'm going to use the building funds that Mr. Torian started and add on to it. And then on top of it, 
I will tax those people, the 2% of the new home buyers, not the 82%, the 92%, the, sorry, 98%. The only 2% I will tax that when they buy a home that is worth more than 20 million, 10 million, 5 million, or 3 million. Those people that can afford to buy a home that is worth five to ten million dollars, surely they can pay the land transfer tax a bit more money so we can then have money for the tenants, for the homeless, to build housing. That's where I'm going to find the money. The math, the math still doesn't add up. Because when you, when you actually look at, we have a projection $46 billion uh, pressure in our budget over the next decade. And the city build fund is already spoken for. So it's one thing to sort of like, you know, come up with plans and try to figure out things so that you can justify them when you're running for election. But the reality of the budget is that currently, even in our operating, we have a $1.5 billion shortfall. The capital pressure is $46 billion over 10 years. We need to actually start playing catch up to meet the needs of our infrastructure demands now, rather than to pretend that, that that fund is going to be available for what you're announcing. It doesn't actually make sense. Well, I wasn't on council in the last 10 years, and I don't understand how that big budget hole has arrived. I know, well, um, maybe ask some of your colleagues. As I said, I have built budgets, and it starts with talking to people what are their needs first. Okay? You don't go and say, arbitrary, this is the percentage of tax increase or what. You actually say, ask the folks, what service do we need? And then we build it. And now we have a billion dollar budget hole. My math is that if we increase a third of a 1%, of that building fund you're talking about, it would raise about $400 million, okay? And we can then pay the down payment for the 25,000 units of affordable housing that we have. That's how we're gonna do it. And also, on top of that, um, Thank you, Mr. Chow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mitzi Hunter. Again, just a reminder, you have 45 seconds to ask your question. The respondent will have 90 seconds for the response, then you will have an additional 45 seconds to follow up, and respond to about 60 seconds for, your, for their final remarks. So my question is to Olivia. As we've been discussing very importantly, the lack of affordable housing is leaving people with fewer dollars to buy food. Your proposal on housing had, had a headline of 25,000 units, but the fine print is only 10,000, that's the real promise. So Olivia, to make things even worse, you only promise 30% affordable. So why isn't this more ambitious? Given the size of the problem of housing affordability, why is it only 30%? That's too low, and 10,000 is not nearly enough to fix the problem. I agree with you, I totally agree with you that 10,000 units is a drop in the bucket. I, I agree. But it's better than none whatsoever. It's better than none being built right near to income. It's better than, well, at least the city of Toronto is building it right near to income. And I also said that we will challenge the federal government on the rent near to income. Yes, we would put in $10,000 for rent subsidies. Sorry, with a uh, 1,000 units of rent subsidy. The city council has also asked the federal government to come up with their share of rent subsidies, just at the last council. If they actually come to the table, we're looking at 3,000 units of rent geared to income housing. So if you add it up, and if we can get the participation of the federal government, and we could work together to make that happen, we could build so much more. Because there is an $82 billion national housing fund. There's an offer there. We need to go and take it 
and I agree with you. It is the city responsibility to do the building. And for far too long we haven't done it. Me as a mayor, I will start doing it precisely that way. Going back to building housing once again by the city government, not just private developers. the city as the builder. The city has to take that ownership of those units and I'm pleased to hear you say that. However, I did not hear you say that you're going to do better than 30% and you yourself said there's 90,000 people waiting on the wait list for supportive housing, right? So that's RGI. So my plan is different because it is 77% affordable and deeply affordable units that will be built on those city-owned lands so that we can get more people rapidly into affordable housing. My plan also offers 2,000, not 1,000 units of supportive housing with wraparound care for mental health and wellness because we need to fix the six and we gotta get on with it. Ms. Ms. Andrew, do you have a follow-up question? I want to know why there's not a more ambition in this plan. It's only 30% affordable. Why are you giving 70% to developers? That's not solving the problem. Not to developers, it's to the city affordable rent here to income housing. Okay? It's owned by the city, not by a private developer. That's a big difference. And it's rent control. That, that makes a difference. On top of that, I don't believe that we put everyone that needs subsidy into one building. That's called ghettos, building ghettos. I believe in mixed income housing. Let's all live together. Whatever your income is, whether you need deep subsidy, a bit of subsidy, or you need no subsidy whatsoever, let's come together because I don't want to see some of those buildings 100% rent due to income. That will not work. We've seen that picture before. Let's not do that again. Thank you. Olivia Chell, this is now your opportunity to ask a question. Again, you'll have 45 seconds to ask your question. The respondent will have 90 seconds. You will then be able to have an additional 45 seconds to follow up. The respondent will have 60 seconds. Great. Um, this question is to Mr. Bradford. Um, I just did some calculation. With the fare increase, it's about $220 for a family of four, of two adults and two teenagers, making five rounds of trips per week. That's a lot of money that you're taking out the pocket of people that needs TTC in the middle of a housing crisis, in the middle of affordability crisis, in the middle of people needing to get to the food bank. How could you do that? Why did you vote for that? You're on the executive committee, the housing committee, there's like, there's, you're on a lot of committees. I don't understand why you would raise the fare and then cut the service.
that with you in a leadership position, those conversations would not take place. We would not be able to sit down with the province. We would not be able to sit down with the federal government and get a fair deal for Toronto because your approach is to fight with other levels of government and all the solutions to these complicated issues are about working together. So that's what we need to do on transit. That's what we need to do on housing. Your plan is to jack people's taxes and make life more expensive. I'm going to fight for affordability. Mr. Bradford, I want to remind you that, you know that TDC subway line on Yonge Street, you know that subway cars, you know where that money came from? It came from 1% of gas tax that was through the Martin Lane budget. That was a billion dollar investment in the cities all across the country. Let me remind you of my past accomplishment. I don't have enough time to raise it, to give you all the details, but let me ask you one more question. You've been on the executive committee, you've been on the housing, you're now the housing czar. Not one shuffle in this Toronto, uh, whatever it's called, housing now program. Not one, well, where is it? I don't see any housing now. There's not one shuffle now. Why is it that it hasn't been built? No shuffle at all. housing hasn't been built is because we have all of these bureaucratic programs like you're supposing and suggesting that actually get in the way of unlocking supply. As the chair of planning and housing, I have done more to advance housing in the city Oops. in the past five months than has happened in the past five years and certainly since the time you were on city council decades ago. So we have legalized multi multiplex in the city. We have ended exclusionary zoning. Those were policies that you put in place at the time of amalgamation. They've actually exacerbated the affordability crisis because you have locked people out of the neighborhoods. Multi-tenant housing. I lived in multi-tenant housing. It's the baseline of affordability here in this city. Since I've become the chair of planning and housing, we've legalized it. Those were policies that you put in place way back when, when you were in government. So it's been a long time. I'm happy that you're here. But Torontonians need real, practical solutions to the housing crisis. They don't need any of the activists that are going to jack their taxes and not collect any results. Ms. Wyla, if you get an opportunity, panel, uh, you'll have 45 seconds to ask your question. The respondent will have 90 seconds for their response. You'll then have an additional 45 seconds to follow up. 60 seconds will be given to the respondent. Go ahead. And my question is uh, to Olivia as well, because I think we're all trying to understand the math. Uh, that really doesn't work, and you've already indicated that you will be raising tax to fund your proposals. The city is also uh, with a $1.5 billion budget hole. That, that would require almost 39% of the property tax increase. So on an, with an affordability crisis, how do you justify increasing taxes and making life more affordable for people? Thank you for that question, Anna. I don't know that billion dollar, the reason why there's a big budget hole, as I said. Being on the budget committee for 10 years has always been a balanced budget. It's never been a big deficit. From my reading of the City of Toronto staff recommendation, is that sometime in July, if the provincial and the federal government won't come to the table, then they're looking at some reserve funds and they're looking for some capital of current. And there's been a report, I believe, that said this, this is how they're going to deal with it. I looked at it, okay? And I think everyone at the table here probably was supportive, but let me tell you one thing. I am not a person that would, behind closed door, negotiate some deal because it doesn't work. We've seen it not work. That's why we're in the budget hole. You know where power is? Power is when we come together and say to our other levels of government that you need to pay your fair share. That's when we get the power. That's, that's when we get results. And we've seen it before. We've seen a fair deal before. 
Okay? It was done about 12 years ago with former mayor David Miller. And we haven't had it since. And he didn't just do the negotiation behind closed doors, he worked with all of us. And I would do the same. Olivia, it's actually concerning that you don't understand why and how and where it's coming from, the $1.5 billion hole in our budget when you're running for mayor of Toronto. We also have a $46 billion pressure in our budget that we're going to need to tackle. You've been building the NDP party. We've been building the city. How are you going to be dealing with the provincial and federal government to get a fair deal for the city of Toronto? <laughs> I'm sorry. The time that I've been not in government, I was building people up. I was training them how to become, to get their voice, become effective, to make changes, to get the government to do what kind of change they need. I didn't go and work for a private developer or a lobbyist. They will tell you that Olivia Chow knows the budget really well. And I've always protected the reserve funds so that we don't spend money we don't have, so that we have a rainy day reserve funds. We always have a triple A credit rating at this at that time. And now I notice it's double um, A credit rating. It slipped somewhat in the last while. Okay? So we need to come back to the table and say involve people in the budget process. Not just behind closed door, ask people what they need, build it together with them, because that is how a good city, a caring city, a more affordable city can be built, where everyone feels that city hall works for them and not the other way around. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, no surprise, my question is also for Olivia. Um, a lot of questions tonight. Um, look, you just described wanting a good city. You just described wanting a caring city and an affordable city. I think actually all of us here want a good and caring and affordable city. My concern is actually hearing everything that you've been talking about in your proposals and how you're going to bankrupt this city, how you are going to make life less affordable for Torontonians. It's the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. So you talk about the vacant home tax, you talk about the city building fund, you talk about MLTT. We've actually done the math on that, and it doesn't pencil. We have estimates that your proposals today will increase property taxes by 20% for Torontonians. And so my question to you, is how high is too high for Olivia Chow to raise property taxes in Toronto because people are terrified. People are terrified when they lose their homes. They're terrified when they have to come to the food bank. That's what they're terrified about. They're terrified that the bus never shows up or the subway closed down. Just like the other day on Bloor Street, I saw people you know, walking, stuck on buses. That's what they're terrified about. I don't know how you get that 20%. I don't understand your math. Let me tell you about the land transfer tax. I'm not raising any of it for people that are buying homes that are under $3 million. Nothing's going to change. But the only thing that will change are those that actually can buy, can afford to buy a home that is about 10 million bucks or 5 million bucks. And there's only 2%. Two out of 100 people that will have to pay a bit more. Okay? That is my plan. And I am raising the vacancy 
home tax because if you're, if you're speculating, leaving a home vacant, you should pay more than 1%. You should pay 3%. I am raising it. I'm not ashamed of it. Vancouver. Vancouver is 5%, okay? I'm raising it to 3% so we can get some of the funds. And if you add it all up, it's balanced. So, so I'm going to try it one more time. And respectfully, I heard that they're struggling with math here. But I'm going to try it one more time. Now, folks at home, listen to this. We're going to hear about a caring and compassionate city. We all want that. But the question for Olivia Chow is very simple. How high are you going to raise people's taxes? Because you can talk about vacant home tax, you can talk about city building fund, MLTT, try and pull the wool over everybody's eyes and pretend that that's a panacea of revenue tools. It's not there. The numbers don't add up, Olivia. So again, I'll give you one more opportunity. Be very honest with Torontonians. Don't dodge. I know you've been in politics a long time. Don't dodge, though. Just answer the question for everybody in the room and everybody at home. How much are you going to jack everybody's taxes here in Toronto? Over to you. You were under the executive committee of the last team, okay? And for some reason, your math seems to think that if you jack up the, the fares on TTC riders, that you're going to somehow get more riders, and therefore you make more money, that you can use that money to fill the budget hole. That's not how I do my math. I do my math based on what people want and what people need. And of course, at the core of it is about affordability. Homeowners, some of them are cash poor, house rich. They can't afford a huge property tax increase. And never in my city hall um, career as a city councillor did I put a, a huge tax increase on people. I've never voted for that. And that is not my style. Thank you. No way, it's very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are now going to go to audience questions. We've gathered and sorted uh, some great insightful questions. Each candidate will get uh, one question about 90 seconds for your response. We're starting back at uh, Mitzi Hunter. Mitzi, that's the question for you. Who support raising ta taxes in Toronto to fund social programs? Well, we definitely need to have a city that uh, can make sure that we fix transit, fix housing, and fix services. And invest in the city in order to do that. Property taxes is the main source of revenue that the city has. I will commit as mayor, I will not raise taxes to the point that it's an unaffordable city. Right? We already have challenges when it comes to affordable housing and people are leaving the city. Right? We already were here at the Deliberate Food Bank talking about people not having enough food to eat. So affordability is the main issue in, in this election for sure. And uh, while we need to have sources of revenue through property taxes to pay for the priorities that we have as a city, like building more affordable housing, like making sure that we lower fares on the TTC so that we can get our ridership up, making it free for seniors, and, uh, and looking after. My plan also calls for expanding library hours six hours more on Sundays so that people can go into the public library and utilize those resources. And of course, we have to find a way to pay for that. I have committed to providing a fully costed plan to support all of the proposals and the plans that I have said before voting begins in June so that when people vote for me as their mayor, they know exactly what they are getting and they are getting someone who is bringing broader set of experiences to the city. I've served on the Treasury Board, I've been the Associate Minister of Finance, and I know that we need to make sure that the city is always in balance as well. Ah, technical difficulties aside, let's continue on. After a few short minutes. We do have some great questions that have been written down that we want to get to. Thank you again for writing down your questions. Olivia Chow, this question is for you. What will you and we we not fund 
in order to better fund the things that are most needed. I can read it. Can we read it? Again? Yeah, no, I, I got it. Okay. The question is what I would not fund. Well, I think just by reducing some of the needless media of adjustment because of the zoning changes, then we are in fact having some red tape. It would free some, uh, some city planners up to speed things up. So I don't think we should not fund them. One thing though, that I've noticed because I just experienced that, is that sometimes what we need is people that have experience in dealing with people with mental health crisis. And what we can do is in fact have the Toronto crisis, um, community crisis team work together with the police so that we deal with the heart of the problem and in some cases it's mental health. And when we're talking about mental health, sometimes if the police comes, it leads to tragedy. And they need the kind of support because they're not trained necessarily to deal with people that have mental health crisis. So we need a combination of both mental health team professionals working to the, with the police to deal with the situation that we are just witnessing. When we are revitalizing our main streets, when, when we are advancing transit infrastructure, 
we have to make it a priority to ensure that we have accessibility for every Torontonian. Because if it doesn't work for our most vulnerable, it doesn't work for everybody. And I will, I will acknowledge and admit the federal government, the provincial government, and yes, City Hall has a lot of work to do on that front. But you know, as the city continues to age, accessibility is going to become a bigger and bigger issue. And so every one of our projects, we need to make that a priority. We need to be a city that works for everybody, for, for kids, for seniors, for everybody in between. Thank you, sir. You'll have an opportunity, hopefully, to talk to the candidates at the end. We are going to move on to closing. Yeah, if you bring me, sir, mid seat. Sir, You'll, this, this is time for closing, closing remarks. Uh, we will now move to closing remarks. Each candidate will have. No, you did. That's the very beginning. Remember, we went through. You got the first quote. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> there was a lot happening. <laughs> All right. So we, everybody has asked their questions. We're now moving to closing remarks. Every candidate will get 90 seconds uh, to uh, have their closing remarks. And we will start with Ms. Chat. To those that are using food banks, I understand how tough it is out there. I get it, but do not give up hope. Spring is here. Change can come and will come. And for those who are volunteering for the food bank, that are working on the food bank, together with you and the clients and the people that you serve, let's come and together and make changes, because I got your back. I understand the crisis. I understand the desperation. Because for far too long, tenants have been told to wait. Seniors waiting for affordable housing have been told to wait. Homeless folks have been told to wait to get into some kind of units. And families waiting for affordable childcare have been told to wait. Enough already. 
The time to act is now. I'm Olivia Chow. I'm running to be your mayor. Join me because together we can make change. We can create a city that is affordable, caring, safer, where we all can come together and feel we belong. Let's do it now. On June 26, Toronto has a choice. They can choose opposition. They can choose somebody that will work only against the other orders of government. They can choose somebody that will make their life less affordable. They can choose somebody that really doesn't know how to build housing. Or they can have a better way. On day one, I will be ready to work with council. I will be ready to fix services and build housing. I will be ready to stand up, to collaborate with other orders of government to deliver for our city. I want to make sure that that feeling that I got when I was 15 and arrived in this country, that feeling of opportunity that we had a city that worked, that we bring it back. And I will bring it back. My name is Anna Bala, and I'm running to be the next mayor. Well, thanks very much. I'd like to thank uh, the Daily Bread Food and all the organizations for bringing us, and the hundreds of folks who took time out of your busy, busy lives to engage in the civic conversation tonight. My name is Brad Bradford, and I am running to be a strong mayor of action at City Hall. I worked in the civil service as an urban planner. I saw all of the divisional silos. I saw the lack of accountability. I saw the pervasive attitude that whatever doesn't get done today will get done tomorrow. And I ran for council to make a difference. Since I've been there, I have seen the type of endless debate, deferral, delay that has not addressed those key issues of better affordability. There's a lot of politicians here who spend all their time on Twitter, consumed in the echo chamber of the Twitter conversation, and instead of listening to real Torontonians in real life about the issues that matter most to them. What are those issues? Affordability. What is the biggest bill that you pay every month? It's your rent or it's your mortgage. It's never been more expensive to live in this city. Community safety. People don't feel safe on transit anymore. We need to make transit safer. And getting around the city. You know, folks out here in Etobicoke, it is a nightmare to get across Toronto. We need real solutions to the real problems. Career politicians are not the answer. And I have to be honest with folks, I'm very concerned about what I heard tonight and that the increase access and how ability uh, because people are really struggling out there, you know. They're, they're... just to get a committee appointment or a junket or whatever they go for. You know, when, when I believe that something is right and true and honest and costed and funded and helpful, I champion it and I support it. But when something's wrong or dishonest, we have to challenge it. We've got to speak up. I feel the same way about Doug Ford. If Doug Ford does something good for Toronto as your mayor, I will go and work with him and I will achieve results. But when he sells off our green belt, when he privatizes our waterfront, when he makes life less affordable in Toronto, I will take a stand for Toronto. So, you know, the people who I really wish I could debate here tonight are not here. Mark Saunders, hi, Mark, if you're watching. 
and come forward, who needs to start stepping up and coming through for the people, for the people, who he said he's going to serve. Thank you. Because everything is not going well in our city. Listen, if you think it's just fine in Toronto, then you should vote for someone else. I repeat, if you think that everything is just A-OK, -okay, then vote for someone else. I see you. I hear you. Yes! And that is why we need to take Toronto on a different track, right? You know it. I know it. For the city that we love, it means that we have to do things differently so that we get different results, the results that we deserve. I'm focused on making sure that we have a city that works for everyone everywhere in our city, from Scarborough to North York, Etobicoke, East York, downtown, midtown, everywhere. A city that works for you. You know, my, my niece, and she's in her 20s. She doesn't think that she'll ever be able to rent a place of her own or buy a home. We gotta change that. Take a look at my plan. It will unlock city lands. 77% 77, 77 more affordable housing. Because we need to fix the six and make sure that we have a Toronto that works for everyone. And join me in this effort. And that concludes our debate. Thank you for being here. Let's give a round of applause to our candidates. And that's all, folks.